Hello, everybody. Um, I, too, would like to um, acknowledge the traditional own owners, the uh, Wadja people, and uh, any uh, Aboriginal people here today. Pay respects to um, elders past and present. Now, um, thematically, the Blade Runner universe talks to us about identity, finding it, losing it, and misunderstanding it. And over the course of the two major motion pictures and the three short films that accompany the last one, Blade Runner 2049, we follow characters who are variously trying to find their true identity or who are trying to hide it. This paper was a collaborative effort and I would like to acknowledge Michael Organ, Susan Jones and Anthony Rice who did most of the work on, on the paper. Um, our paper examines memory and identity through the lens of the Blade Runner films and what that may mean in the context of developing and delivering archival collections to researchers in the world. Time is limited here and I'll briefly discuss those themes which in our paper are considered at greater length. I'll also digress with a few factoids gleaned during the research of the paper um, that perhaps will help to illustrate the points we try to make or perhaps won't. So, excitingly for those of us labouring in the archives, we see a story unfold which highlights the importance of archival memory as an integral tool in the resolution of identity. Historical records support the search for meaning while their absence undermine the sense of self and the sense of belonging. In Blade Runner 2049, it is the absence of information, records, proof and fact that underpin the dramatic action. We learn that important records were destroyed in an EMP event engineered out of the frame of the motion picture but told in the related anime by replicant revolutionaries and how that act created gaps in the record, space to hide and to survive, enough elbow room to cloud what is real, who is real and whether those distinctions matter anyway. Now there's a scene in Blade Runner 2048, Nowhere to Run, um, which is one of the accompanying short films that Denis Villeneuve had commissioned, uh, where Sapper Morton hands a young friend a copy of The Power and the Glory, telling her it is about an outlaw priest trying to understand the meaning of being human. The young friend asks, it's not sad, is it? To which he replies, it's one of my favorites, you'll love it. Sapper Morton, outlaw replicant, is all for life. Life is elusive. Rutger Heyer, as Roy Batty in the original Blade Runner, sums this up with his famously passionate invocation against the dying of the light, tears in the rain, which become diluted and indistinguishable from rain. Nothing is significant. Nothing lasts. Philip K. and the K stands for kindred, by the way, Dick's later work, Flow My Tears, the policeman said, which he wrote in 1974, continues the theme of tears, this time reference from a 16th century heir attributed to John Doland. You can sing along with me if you like. No, no. Um, but it begins, flow my tears, fall from your springs. And essentially it's a, um, a poem about uh, the fleetingness of life and how one can't happen to be depressed all the time about how, how short life is. The, um, the last couple of lines sum it up. Hark, you shadows that in darkness dwell, learn to contemn light. Happy, happy, they that in hell feel not the world's despite. And there's a really beautiful version of this on, on YouTube um, with the Australian Chamber Orchestra, and it's uh, sung by Fiona Campbell, which I, I encourage you to look up if you're interested in this kind of stuff. Now, that air is a fairly depressing view of the world, but it wasn't an uncommon one for the Elizabethans, where life was, in fact, short, not unlike the life expectancy of replicants. The brevity of life and its seeming pointlessness is a recurring theme in Philip K. Dick's writing, and probably no coincidence. Dowland references pop up all over Dick's work. For example, the protagonist in the Minority Report is named Dowland, and Dick would frequently use the pseudonym John Dowland for short stories published in magazines. Dick plays games with identity. The replicants check for serial numbers, printed quite gruesomely on the eyes of their quarry, a literal eye identity that cancels their humanity, no matter how peaceful or remote they may be. There is, however, something to be said about the use of a 400-year-old song and a poet in the context of bemoaning mortality. Life is short, but his work lives on, both in the case of Dowland and in Philip K. Dick himself, who, who died in 1982.
So this is a quote from Descartes from, from the book, um, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? And he's talking about a fake horse here. Um, in, in the book, there are no real animals left, so they make believe with artificial ones. And I guess, you know, in the same way that people happily purchase knockoffs of luxury brands like Louis Vuitton and Hermes, from a distance, it might look all right, um, but up close, its imperfections are, are nerve-wracking. The details expose you to the risk of uncertainty and the painful reality that you are only faking it. Yet copying is an innate human behaviour. Psychologists tell us that, that through mirroring, through mirroring others, we learn who they are. We establish a concept of our own self and in so doing are able to be part of the whole, a paid up member of the human race. It's no surprise that people crave unattainable, unattainable designer goods so that they too can be as one with their idols, the rich and the famous and the powerful. Dick's middle name is Kindred. It may come as no surprise. He is one of us and conversely, we are at one with him. He's not some other, an outsider or a foreigner. Now, a modern politician or a Sky News guest perhaps would use the terms boat person or illegal, where those in the imagined future use the term skin job. And as you're probably aware already, the heroic death of Roy in the original movie is not an event that occurs in the book. There is no battle, and more importantly, no final poetic vi vision of what it was like to have lived. No, in the book, Roy gets erased, and that's about it. Dick himself was not involved in the screenplay and was at first quite hostile to the production and the initial script for the movie, which was written by Hampton Fancher. A subsequent rewrite of Fancher's script by David Peoples turned out more to uh, Dick's liking. And we know this because there's an awful lot of material surviving Dick. His personal archives are held at the California State University and there's an active community of scholarship and fandom surrounding his work. Now, in his last interview before he died, Dick discusses the problems around the movie production. His publisher was preparing to republish Do Android's Dream of Electric Sheep. Dick had made the artistic decision to not collaborate on a screen version of the novel, and in so doing, he forwent a considerable sum of money. But he wanted to maintain the original book, not a movie version of it. And during this process, there were threats and counter-threats around the based on credit in the movie and forbidding the use of Blade Runner imagery in the publication of the new edition of the novel and things like that. Um, but one of the curious things about art is that it can be bought and reconfigured almost endlessly so that the original work of art bears only the slightest similarity to any subsequent works. And at least in this case, if the rights are owned by another, the original creator has little control. So does he know what's real? Do we know what's real? Given that Blade Runner has four extant versions, there was the original 1982 domestic US release, there, which was less violent than the international release, then there was the 1992 director's cut, and then there was the 2007 final cut, which if you've watched it, and that's the version that's going around now, it's very, very, very long. They're all distinct. Um, the 1982 editions of the movie have a completely different ending, uh, with Descartes and Rachel escaping to the country and living, living happy, happily ever after. But the later movies are more ambiguous and dark in their ending. And this is more in line with the outcomes of the novel and tinged perhaps with the idea that Descartes is a replicant himself. Consider also that while while the movie is based loosely on Philip K. Dick's Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, the title Blade Runner is from Alan E. Norse's 1974 book, from which William S. Burroughs wrote Blade Runner, a movie. Now, Hampton Fancher, who wrote the screenplay for Blade Runner, the movie, ha happened across the script, and he really liked the title. So Ridley Scott purchased the rights to the title, but not the rights to the story, which is about someone who smuggles black market surgical implements and applied that on to Philip K. Dick's work, which was then rendered in turn by another couple of screenwriters, a whole phalanx of designers, and then filtered through nuanced performances from actors who, at least in one noted instance, completely altered the script with their own ad lib. Another interesting factoid while we're here considering this is that Dick himself was hopeless at titling his stories and relied on his publisher to come up with catchy phrases. After his death, his wife was interviewed and confirmed that he was not responsible for the book titles. If he had, she said, he would have been an advertising writer and not a novelist. So within the various versions of the movies, there is, no, there is the further question of the nature of Descartes himself. Is he human or is he a replicant? 
The original movie does not pose this question, but it is part of the darker ending of the recut versions. Blade Runner 2049 is much clearer around who are the skin jobs and who isn't. Descartes is still in the grey area, something that Denise Villeneuve was happy to leave ambiguous. There is no certainty, even in the fictional realm. So the ambiguity of humanity is explored further through holograms and their relationships with Kay and other humans. The hologram, a function of light and shadow, variously depicted as light shadows in the decrepit Las Vegas and the convincing emotional reality of Kay's partner, Joy. And we are challenged to imagine this actually working, but as a real relationship. And insofar as we respond to Ryan Gosling's portrayal of the replicant Kay, we do. So it's intriguing that most of the higher level human emotions, love, grief, confusion, and growth, are demonstrated by the non-human characters of the movies. While the human characters are seedy, blunt, withdrawn, and downright creepy, somehow humanity has lost its humanity and outsourced it, along with the other dirty jobs, to machines. So who decides what is real and who decides what we know? Decidering, as David Foster Wallace discusses in his essay, Total Noise, is a service of great utility to the increasingly overwhelmed general public as they get more and more and more. But the noise gets ever louder and the decisions around what we keep and what we don't get harder. When the replicant revolution attempts to alter the future by erasing their past, destroying the records that bind them to a certain fate, we anticipate chaos. Much in the same way that recent events in the US demonstrate a form of deciderization that serves a short-term political position. Just, just briefly, if you can't see that, that the um, uh, the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency asked the US Archive to allow it to destroy records in relation to um, deaths in their custody as well as sexual assaults and a few other things. This, this came out when they lost those, those children in, um, that had, had been deported. You know, and I find the time frames around that disposal quite interesting particularly in relation to the movies. 20 years is not a very long time. Now, and less than 30 years separates the replicant EMP event in the movies with Blade Runner 2049. And the ensuing chaos of the destruction of recorded information forms much of the tension in the movie. One could easily imagine the world of the Blade Runner's future um, today. You know, there's one quick line in 2049 about, you know, my mother still cries about the baby photos in relation to the, to the EMP. And, um, and that anchors the loss in an understandable way. Yet, we react against the threat of record destruction, but we also will do as little as possible to assist with the collection of information, fearing invasions of privacy and misuse. We are deeply suspicious of the why and the how information will be used and by whom. And I'll just nod in the direction of Cambridge Analytica and the My Health Record opt-out processes here, but they exist today and, and, and challenge us. Furthermore, recent contentions in the political arena and by certain media outlets revising historical facts around the rise of national socialists in the 1920s to suit themselves illustrate that the reality is open to interpretation. The Holocaust did not happen. There are no children on Nauru. The boat has been towed outside of the environment. And that is just as confounding as any fiction. Facts we don't like don't have to be facts at all. Consider too that large chunks of the global population have already outsourced their decidering, not to information professionals, but to algorithms. This can't help but to impact upon the information we eventually archive, and then what is later consulted in an effort to determine the why and the how of something. The surviving record will be worse than erased. It will be wrong, and who will know? So we cannot really know for sure what we want to believe, what we want to be is inevitably going to colour our judgement. The translation difficulties that arise over time will further distort context and ultimately truth. 
Dennis Villeneuve says that Blade Runner 24, 2049 is not really a film about technology, but rather philosophy, consciousness, empathy, and mortality. And in very real ways, this mortality threatens not just the life of the living, but the life of our records as well. Our stories will not survive intact if we do not protect them and maintain their truth. Thanks. Now, this is frequently about accepting things that we do not like. Speaking as a middle-class white male and a middle-aged middle-class white male at that, I find I continually need to challenge my perspective in my practice. Why do I privilege some collections over others? How much of my identity comes through in my professional decidering? Is my identity, belief and culture an obstacle to the truth in the long run? Wallace concludes that the answer lies in the acceptance of our own ignorance. Not just the intelligence to discern one's own error or stupidity, but the humility to address it, absorb it and move on and out therefrom bravely toward the next revealed error. Ultimately, we have to accept our own mortality and our failings, like John Doland wishing that death would release us from the fear of dying, knowing that we have lived and that our works and our stories will continue without us. And as Roy Batty finally concludes, after he talks, well, I'll read it, I've seen things you people wouldn't believe, attack ships on fire off the shoulder of Orion, I watch sea beams glitter in the dark near the Tannhäuser Gate, all those moments will be lost in time like tears in the rain. But then there's another line that no one ever, ever adds to this, and that is, time to die. Thank you. <laughs>